Elliott Sadler um, was smoking. And in fact, caution is coming out for oil. It's really hard to breathe inside that car yeah. right now. They gave me the tools to win the race. I just, I let them down there at the end. Oh, the hard. Wow, oh, Ricky Rod. Oh, he turned it. No. Oh, he turned oh, it. No. Oh, they oh, turned it. And Junior, Junior gets the lead. No lug nuts on that left rear. Dropped the jack. Uh -huh. Never even looked back. He'll restart in the back. They're taking it to the garage. Kyle says it's the drive shaft. In 1993, the pedigree dog food brand would try out a new test of agility when they would be adopted as a NASCAR sponsor by the Rulo brothers. Years of racing in the Arca series had gotten them to June 20th of the 1993 season where Jim Sauter would finish a respectable 26th in the organization's debut. Over the next two seasons, Pedigree would be the primary backer for the Rulo brothers with many unique driver breeds in this race car such as Scott Legacy Sr., Dick Trickle, Chuck Brown, and Rich Bickle, remaining a part-time field filler team. After seven races with the Rulo brothers, Pedigree would take two years off by returning to the NASCAR Cup Series that we all know and love with the race team run by Dirt veteran Ken Schrader. In a collaboration with Cole Con Pet Care Pedigree started two races with Jack Sprague, finishing 1 23rd at Phoenix, while wrecking out of the second due to a skirmish with Todd Bodine that mangled the entire front nose of his Pontiac. Still, there would be no yellow thrown, yes, even with all the potential debris and Bodine sliding sideways, much like NASCAR has always been, this would be a balls and strikes call from the front towers they held off from throwing the yellow. For the next venture for Pedigree, we have to throw the Frisbee a few years down the road. It would be a while before they would get back into NASCAR competitively, and that next year would be the 1999 season. Mars as a company decided to capitalize on a booming motorsport by going all in on the Nelson Bowers 36. The company was destined to make Skittles the most popular rainbow in NASCAR, though the mountain was as steep as it gets with Jeff Gordon dominating the tour in the late 1990s. For one race and one race only, Mars would stop their quest to get Skittles to that mountain to instead promote the pedigree dog food brand on a NASCAR Cup Series car for the first time since 1996. Pairing up with 15-time NASCAR Cup Series winner Ernie Irvin, as this was an aggressive driver, an aggressive breed of driver, he was not afraid to hold back. And two years removed from a Michigan winner, Irvin was a good boy for pedigree in this race, getting them a 7th place finish in their return, allowing for some decent television exposure of the pit crew's uniform for the afternoon. And you can just tell, that fit was sick as a dog. The turn of the century saw Mars rethink its activation in NASCAR's premier series, as Skittles was out as the go-to candy at MB2 Motorsports. In was M&M's, also getting two races in this rebranding of the Mars brand in NASCAR was Pedigree. Ernie Irvin was also gone in favor of a guy they considered to be Dog's best friend. Ken Schrader, this time he would be the driver rather than the owner, as over the next three seasons, Pedigree would more than double their involvement in the sport by being the anchor brand for 12 races including two Coca-Cola 600s and the 2002 Brickyard 400, a race that had a lot of eyeballs. As for the results, despite Atlanta in 2001, where he lit a lap, a feeling similar to riding shotgun with your tongue out the window, well, for a dog, Schrader failed to record another top 10 and had a lot of mid-pack performances. Though to his credit, he wouldn't DNF a lot in the pedigree colors. And there's really nothing to sugarcoat here. The MB2 Motorsports team didn't really have the speed. Ken Schrader never really was a weekly contender to win races. That was a stark contract from the Robert Yates Racing Organization. This was one that knew how to be competitive at the NASCAR Cup Series level. Winning the championship with Dale Jarrett in 1993 as well as various successful years with Davey Allison. Though with Ricky Rudd and Havlin out the door, it left a hole in their empire. Perfect for a Mars brand that wanted to win in NASCAR. That's all they cared about. They wanted to get some wins under their belt. The new driver for Pedigree would be Elliot Sadler, who had that same ambition. Contrary to that goal, Pedigree in 2003, it was an absolute disaster for them. As beginning at Auto Club, Elliot Sadler stayed gone to the dogs with a 23rd place finish. And believe it or not guys, that was one of the better performances in that season. Because at Charlotte, he as the outside pole sitter was trying to be the lucky dog when Ricky Craven's motor expired. He would attempt to grab that biscuit, the ultimate 
free pass by going on the outside trying to pass the leader to get that lap back and in doing so Elliott Sadler would get into the oil and tear up his race car turning out to be one poached pooch with a 36th place finish. Indianapolis he blew a motor, Kansas he had a right front tire issue which pancaked the entire right side of his car and at Phoenix he would have his best run of the season. That was 20th place. I'll tell you right there, that car is going to make for a good in-depth cursed NASCAR paint video in the future. So of course, considering how much of a disaster the pedigree car was in 2003, for 2004 it would feature a redesign and it would be a clean slate and this would end up proving to be one of Elliott Sadler's better seasons of his career. So how'd he do with the pedigree colors? That's the main question of this part of the video and honestly he didn't do as bad as 2003. I can tell you that as his two most noted races in the colors were Charlotte for the Coca-Cola 600 where he led 41 laps, one of his better performances in this crown jewel race to finish 5th, and then you had Kansas in October for my 4th birthday as I was blowing out the candles, Elliott Sather would grab the lead with 39 laps remaining. One week after going upside down, the result was going to be right side up for Elliott Sather. It was looking promising. That lead was short-lived as Joe Nemechek made the pass, the pass for the win that broke a 54-race winless streak of his. Pedigree's drought would remain. 2005 would include some big markets as you had Auto Club near Los Angeles and Charlotte, which were decent runs, and then you also had Michigan, which was unfortunately an outright disaster after his bad luck continued on lap 82, which continued his string of horrible, horrible performances in the late summer, really the collapse of this team in 2005. Now that result right there was not the one that hurt the most, it was far from it, as you had the 2005 running of the NASCAR All-Star Race. Sadler had a contending car in this heat style event leading 21 laps before Mark Martin would turn back the clock to 1993 and make the race winning pass on Elliott Sadler. Pedigree, in a race where second isn't remembered, would finish one spot short of $1 million in all the NASCAR glory. As for 2006, we all know how much of a nightmarish outcome the Robert Yates Racing Team was in that year. They were an absolute disaster, and as for pedigree, it was a throwback to 2003. A subpar finish, a crash, and an 8th place finish, which was a breath of fresh air. A walk in the park with your canine considering the circus swarming Elliott Sadler throughout that season. Despite reassuring the NASCAR media over and over and over again, Hey, I'm not leaving. Yates is my home, and I love it here. Elliott Sadler would leave the 38 team which would make David Gillen the temporary pedigree ambassador for the Labor Day Auto Club race. Here's how that went. Here's Gillen going around. Looks like he was underneath Waltrip and he was trying to turn the car down so he wouldn't drift up into Waltrip. So for 2007, Mars would pull a double to keep the Robert Yates Racing Team from drowning out of existence. The 38 car driven by rookie David Gillen would activate the fan favorite M&Ms leaving the 88 as the second moving billboard to promote Mars products such as Snickers and the Pedigree brand. 23-time NASCAR Cup Series winner Ricky Rudd would sport the colors in four races in his farewell season, hitting the fan favorites Bristol and Richmond as well as big markets Chicago and Phoenix, races that Ricky Rudd was a dud, failing to scrap the top 20 in these events including two DNFs due to close quarter crashes. Finally, after five years, Mars was done. They were packing up the big money and the four dogs and they were going to officially leave Robert Yates Racing for a new home, one with a much greener grass and a much greener outlook. Joe Gibbs Racing was that place, a special place as not only was this organization the Great Dane of the NASCAR Cup Series with three championships but their new breed of driver for the 2008 season in car number 18 was a massive superstar in the making. Whether NASCAR fans thought he had the bark of a pit bull or a chihuahua, Kyle Busch had the pedigree to be one of the best the motorsport has ever seen. And their first race with their new driver, their franchise face, would come at the Richmond Raceway, a track where they had yet to finish inside the top 20. Pedigree had struggled at this facility in their backyard. In this race, Denny Hamlin was the field's master, including Kyle Busch, before a tire issue ended what could have been the most dominant performance in NASCAR history. Pedigree now had the chance to go one for one with Kyle Busch, though it would be perfectly acceptable to finish second. Pedigree was getting their bang for their buck by racing against the most popular driver in the series. Just as long as you don't do anything to piss off Junior Nation, this will be a good Monday board meeting. I believe he's got him this time. Oh, he turned him! No! 
And just like that, Dale Earnhardt Jr. fans would never buy a bag of pedigree dog food ever again. That would prove to be Pedigree's best chance to win in 2008, as even with the 18 teams return to Talladega as the defending winner, he had a med day, and he would also have that same outcome in Phoenix to end year one. 2009 would be all around underwhelming for Kyle Busch, and the three Pedigree races were no exception. Finishing outside the top 10 at Talladega, Atlanta, where he had a pass differential of negative 21 after leading 24 laps, and then Phoenix, nowhere close to victory in any of those performances. Maybe some left and right turns at Sonoma the next year will change that. Kyle Busch has a you know, you know the thing for wine country after winning this race in 2008, though he did not get off to the best start. In happy hour practice, he went off course twice and qualified an un-Kyle Busch-like 27th for this race. He was back there with the squirrels, as they call them, in short track racing, and that was something that could only cause trouble for a dog. There. And then the one gets hammered by the 18. 18 in turn. The collision in the S's proved to be X marks the spot for the front nose of Kyle Busch's car, which received major contending ending damage. Though he did score two top 10s with these colors in 2010 still, there was no bone for this dog car. They had yet to really get that ultimate prize, the ultimate ribbon like on the Pedigree logo. The 2011 season for Pedigree began with a return to Virginia, their home state, a state that the Pedigree car was ready to finally win at with Kyle Busch. At Martinsville, he led a race high 151 laps. He had the best car getting off of turn two all day. Kyle Busch was in position to create yet another agonizing moment for Junior Nation. He was going to cause nightmares once again, especially that pedigree car. That paint scheme right there, it was going to intimidate Junior Nation for weeks after this event. Not only that, but pedigree was closing in on their first win. It seemed like destiny. It was too good of a situation to end in heartbreak. No, they oh, touch it. And Here comes Junior Tina. gets the lead. Oh, that's not going to be. Clear, clear, clear. Not a happy camper. The pedigree car would have one owner that day, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Atlanta later that year would be the final race of the season for Kyle Busch in the pedigree colors, which would be a disappointing 23rd place finish. It just seems like he lost the handle towards the end of this race. He got a bit free off of turn four and he actually hit the wall. And that would end up being the final pedigree moment, the final certified pedigree moment until 2015 where pedigree would once again be showcased in the NASCAR Cup Series. Though in their first race back, it would not be with their superstars. Kyle Busch's violent injury in the season opening Daytona race had him stuck in the dog pound. Taking over would be the super speedway ace David Reagan. He was not too far removed from his win at Talladega in 2013, which was two years ago or 30 years in dog years. As Donald Trump called him, David Lee Regan. He was going to be a contender for this win. Hopefully Trevor Bain doesn't do anything stupid in this race. Far around, Trevor Bain, a number of cars and involved. more, Logano is cars. in it. Crashing all, oh man. Pedigree's return to the biggest agility course in NASCAR would see them complete it with a wrecked race car 165 laps off the pace in 38th. Race number two of the season would be much more tame, New Hampshire Motor Speedway, as Kyle Busch would chase after the lobster like a German Shepherd would after his owner put out a full bowl of lobster flavored dog food. Yes, that type of dog food exists. Fighting to advance to the round of 12, Kyle Busch needed a good points day and that was it. Halfway through the race in the ninth position, it looked like that was going to happen as Cinderella run was going to continue and be in great health That'll liken to a beagle, considering that is the healthiest dog breed in the world. Leave it to the pedigree sponsorship with an even meatier recipe to allow the right front tire to explode, and the 18 team's hopes of sweeping the state of New Hampshire in 2015. Fortunately, or unfortunately for Kyle Busch fans, in 2016, the clean yellow and blue look would return with a new venue. That would be at Dover, a track that had done a number on Kyle Busch in recent memory, so a reverse jinx for having the pedigree colors that might be a welcome change in this scenario. Let's see what Jimmy Johnson thought of that. Oh, no, Johnson, Johnson, Johnson out of the big wreck. can't go. Big wreck could happen oh, here on the front no, straightaway. Oh, no, man. You are wow. kidding me. You could say in that moment, seven times talent at Dover had gone to the dogs. 
This would start a tradition of just one annual primary race for pedigree. Whether it was intentional or not, Dover again would be the only time this snake bitten livery hit the track in 2017. You could say this was also something that was an attempt for a reverse jinx as there were so many coulda woulda shoulda moments for Kyle Busch in the first half in 2017. He was still winless, he was still without a playoff berth, and potentially in this situation with the pedigree colors this could finally turn his luck around. And this effort to re-steer the ship had started pretty well as Kyle Busch mastered the agility course that had proved to be tricky for race cars as Miles the Monster does not forgive anyone, earning the pole award for Sunday and in the race the 18 led 18 laps before BK Racing did BK Racing things. Now it was up to the pit crew to show their pedigree for the first pit stop of the afternoon. All this on the left rear over here you see that the uh... Jackman let the car down before the, the guy had a chance to tighten the left rear tire up. And Unable to tighten the left rear in one of the most bizarre NASCAR situations with a five lug nut rule before 2022 made it common. The entire tire came off immediately after the pit stop and destroyed the left rear quarter panel. An incident that would continue the misery of the 18 team with Adam Stevens getting suspended for the next four races because this would violate the NASCAR rule book that sends the crew chief, tire changer, and tire carrier home for a detached tire. Though the damage didn't hurt the car's performance, Kyle Busch was no match for a variety of strategies and the speed of the 48, 42, and the 78. A 16th place finish one lap down would continue the disappointing season to that point. Third time's the charm, right? 2018, it was Dover again for the annual race, and this was one race move from Kyle Busch's impressive three race win streak, a complete 180 from the first half of 2017. And I'll bet if you asked him, Talladega did not count because in his eyes, it was not a real racetrack. So it was the perfect time to go four in a row at real NASCAR facilities. And if it weren't for the Stuart Haas Racing Fords and a drivetrain malfunction, that would have been the case. Four into the team, a drive shaft would break on lap 272, which took them out of contention as they whimpered back to the garage for repair. Settling for a 35th place finish, and Kyle Busch would describe his day as follows. We've had issues like this in practice before, and we've been able to figure it out early enough to not have the problem in the race, but this weekend we never had that issue at all until the race started, so felt weird about how that went down. Though pedigree in the NASCAR Cup Series was done for 2018, the company would detour down to the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series to extend their pedigree to a new generation. Todd Gilliland, the son of David Gilliland, was starting to get his feet wet in NASCAR competition, and Pedigree would be the main backer of his races. David Gilliland would also get a start or two here and there in the Kyle Busch 51 truck. So how would a Pedigree car in the truck series do? Well, it was about what you would expect. Took it a victory lane. Oh, contact and around goes Todd Gilliland. Order break there. You okay, Todd? And a big hit for the four. Pedigree would not win any of the races and Todd Gillen would have a very subpar performance with the colors in Kyle Busch Motorsports equipment, equipment that is capable of winning races. So back to Cup, the big show in 2019 would be the final race at Dover for Pedigree with some history on the line as Kyle Busch, he was off to a top 10 streak. He was hoping to tie Morgan Shepard on the afternoon as that is something he would do, believe it or not, with the pedigree colors. As for the first time since 2011, a pedigree car had finished in the top 10 in the NASCAR Cup Series. So that right there was one of the rare uncertified pedigree moments. Meanwhile, the 2020 race for pedigree was a change of scenery as they would be targeting the Northeast Dog Market once again, just this time in Lobster Country for the first time since 2015. This was a season where Kyle Busch was near the playoff cut line and could use a decent finish and a decent first stage. He wouldn't even make it past the competition caution. Man, Kyle Busch and flat right fronts at New Hampshire in the pedigree car. That is the worst combination possible. So it turns out the Northeast is quite cursed, producing a lot of certified pedigree moments. Why don't we take a crack at the South once again? Nashville is not only a booming American market, but it is also a booming dog market. In 2017, it was even reported that downtown Nashville had more dogs living in it than kids. The inaugural race at the Nashville Super Speedway also meant a sold out crowd of 40,000 would have their eyes on the pedigree car as the dog days of summer started to heat up. And all day Kyle Busch fought hard through the pain of having an ill handling car, 
keeping him in position to win before a strategy call and potentially some contact put him back with the squirrels as they call him as the car was so bad that even JJ Yaley was able to sail past his own ride. Yet another certified pedigree moment. Saved by his fellow Australian Shepherd, it would not be a walk in the dog park by any means to get back to the front. Once a car in the mix, 11th was the best Kyle Busch could get in this race. This led into 2022 as it was announced in December of 2021 that Mars would not renew their contract with Joe Gibbs Racing. That meant M&M's, Snickers, Skittles, and Pedigree would be done after this year. And given that Pedigree typically sponsors just one race a season, this was their last chance. One final chance to end the Pedigree curse which would be again the Ally 400 at the Nashville Super Speedway. Track position would be critical, so as long as nothing catastrophic happened, the pedigree car would be in the mix. Oh, 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 he's around! And into the wall. Say it with me, folks, another certified pedigree moment. Kyle Busch started well outside the top 30 for this race, but based on his performance in stage one, he was on a mission. Kyle Busch started well outside the top 30 for this race, but based on his performance in stage one, he was on a mission. Joe Gibbs Racing was the dominant manufacturer, the dominant organization in this race, and on lap 194, Kyle Busch would prove that he was the guy to beat, grabbing the lead from MTJ. NASCAR Nation was officially in the office mode, seeing the pedigree car in the closing stages of the race in the lead. Oh my God! Okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. What's the Everybody procedure, stay calm. Everyone, What's the procedure? Stay so after 30 plus years of certified pedigree moments, all those times where Elliot Sadler would wreck or he would come up short to Mark Martin turning back the clock to his vintage days, that time at Richmond where Kyle Busch would not close the deal, or times like Sonoma and Loudoun and Dover and Loudoun again in 2020 where Kyle Busch would wreck with the pedigree colors, this was going to be the race where all that luck would finally change for pedigree. This was going to be a win for all the dogs of NASCAR as Pedigree was on their way to win number one as a NASCAR sponsor. Oh, Kyle with a little wiggle right there is going to give the lead up. It turns out Chase Elliott was more of a cat person, taking the lead and critical track position before the 77 brought out a yellow to shake up the strategy. Ben Bayshore was thinking Tennessee Titans, having KFB make a pit stop for two tires. The only problem with that, you had a ton of hungry hounds not just in front of him but also behind on four fresh Goodyears. Fitting enough, the pedigree car would become puppy chow for the final restart of the race and likely the final laps of pedigree sponsorship in NASCAR. While riding to the start finish line, Kyle Busch finished 21st with one of the best cars in Nashville. Ending the 63rd attempt for Pedigree to win a NASCAR Cup Series race and in all likelihood the sponsorship as a whole. When you look at Pedigree's stats, I mean there were some good races. You had some top 5s and top 10s, but then again there were a lot of DNFs, a lot of crashes, and a lot of misfortunate finishes. Especially with Kyle Busch, you know, they had a driver that was winning a lot of races. And still, there were many certified Pedigree moments that would keep this sponsorship out of victory lane and that's why pedigree sponsorship is a misfortunate NASCAR legacy. So anyways, this is Nathan for NRF Productions signing out and just remember guys and gals, life's a beach and then you drive.